my daughter played volleyball, so I know how long it. Both my kids are in college. Okay. So that's why I decided to take this on. Excellent. Yeah. So is are you from here? Or are you from California? I'm from SoCal. Well, SoCal. North of Santa Barbara. Okay. Your daughter played club and all she of. She did. She yeah. did. She's at Oregon State actually. Oh, good. Yeah. So on the way down after seeing everybody in Portland, all the stuff. Excellent. See that there. And Corvallis. Corvallis, yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, what position? Uh, she's libero. She's okay. Okay. You're tall, so. Yes. <laughs> Took a hike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's up. My daughter's about five, five, five ten, et cetera. Okay. So Boy, you're in company, though. What's that? Just tall for setter. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's banners and this and that and everything. I mean, you couldn't walk in 10 steps while it's over. Really? Really. really. I mean, they did. Yeah. I heard Doc say they own it, so they have every right to do it. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't think too much, but it was a lot. I would have been a little embarrassed, personally, but not too much. It's okay. Obviously, not money. Uh, yeah, exactly. <sighs> That's why I'm surprised we're working on you went there. Uh, good morning. Good morning, morning sir. Did you go to the meeting? I did. How was it? Um, it was a good meeting, a lot on uh, drug allergy. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot. Um, and then some food allergy stuff, which I'm going to encourage for next year. Okay. And um, I think biomarkers should be very oh, important. Right. I stopped by a couple places uh, for half hour, hour lectures. Yeah. On biomarkers. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to have what, five biologics soon, six oh, yeah. biologics soon. You better know which one to use and which one. <laughs> right. Or you're throwing, you know, what, $1,000 away per vial? There you go. If you're lucky. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Oh, exactly. So I don't think there's an answer for it yet, but I, I, I saw Dr. Penetrary and uh, Dr. Israel. Uh -huh. I'll give a great presentation on um, anti-IG and um, anti-IL-5. IL-5. Yeah, okay. and talk about biomarkers and how to choose the right patients and, and do those kinds of things. And it's a way to the future, isn't it? Oh, it is. And, you know, that's going to be what you guys do. Not me. <laughs> but you're going to ask those questions, right? I, I know you, know you are. <laughs> I only asked a few questions. But, um, you know, the way healthcare is, I mean, if we know the biomarkers and we know... And tailor, tailor the treatment to the exa patient. Exactly. And it's going to get more tailored all the time, sir. Yeah. Yep. So. Um, this is Kelly Ware. Kelly is Hi, a, Kelly. How are you? I'm Nick Panati. Nice to meet you. Um, you know you? A successfully retired... God, you were one of the originals, weren't you? At, uh... <laughs> uh, no, not, not at NAC. I thought you were. No, no, no. The Durban Pearson... Yes, Shapiro. Shapiro, Shapiro and Furukawa. Yeah. They were there I long thought, before me. No, I didn't, oh, really? I didn't get there until uh, 88. Okay. And then I went off to Saudi Arabia for the war and came back and got my, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Okay. Yeah. But I retired in uh, whatever, whenever it was, 2003. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did you get a new Honda? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I was a guy parking in front of you. I'm oh, not was sure. that you? <laughs> not sure either. It was illegal. Well, it says 8 to 5. So I figure by the time 8 o'clock comes around, I should be out of here. Okay. <laughs> you know, put no pressure on. <laughs> no, yeah, I got, uh, you know, I don't need that big SUV anymore. Did you keep it or you sold it? Got rid of it? I sold it. No, it was a good price, too. Actually, it was a price. Yeah? Yeah. All these years later, what are you doing? $300, 200 years old. Okay. Did the Honda dealer riot? No, uh -huh. private. Uh, no, I don't need. No, I don't have a place in the prop, a place in the country anymore. I don't need to take big jails of hay. I don't have to take four bright sheets of plywood. I don't have to do that stuff. You know. So that's a CRV. It's a CRV. Yeah, it's a little smaller. Well, no, it's substantially smaller, but it's big yeah, enough. But it's it's big enough. It's big enough. It's, uh, it's got lots of little bells and whistles on it. Yeah. What are you driving? What was that great thing you drive? It's Ford Escape. So oh, that's what I was going to get. Was that was that was on my final four list. So you got to get... You gotta that was already four years old. So yeah. They changed it. Well, she was up and over. 
Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was the Ford Escape, or maybe the Ford Edge. Yeah, she kind of travels too. around. But yeah, it, 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 okay. The Nissan Murano. And the Kate. 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 Okay. And uh, yeah. Toyota RAV4. Toyota, Toyota RAV4, I, I, I like, but oh, the exactly. tap dashboard is very high. It really cuts down your visibility. How was the meeting? It was good. It didn't rain. It was nice, sunny, blue skies every day. Which What's that like? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how we, why they ever started life here in the north. <laughs> <laughs> it started from moss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just moss. I'm sorry. This is Kelly Ware. Kelly is our uh, thought leader liaison. Hello. Not in sales, Hi. in marketing. Good to see you again, John. Good well. Good to see you. So Kelly periodically will email you and say, do you have 10 minutes and have a couple questions for you? Okay. But not sales. It's more keeping contact with the thought leaders in the field, making sure that we're asking the right questions for the patients. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming today. You see me at all the meetings. you the national meeting. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what we're viewing today. In one hour trying to review what, four days. Yeah. You know, I, I help them. Okay. <laughs> you get credit, right? Yeah, I stand there and smile at them. You say, you can do it. You can do it. You can solve that. You should teach more <laughs> people how to do this because we're really dependent on him getting yeah. here. At yeah, it's six in the morning. We'll blame Panera for the four. Say what, sir? What? I'm just saying, Drew should right. have to learn to pass this responsibility oh, on. Yeah, but, okay. yeah. but they work. Um, yeah, they should be okay. Usually we try and train one of the fellows that at least get to some of sitting around. Uh, to join the faculty? Yeah, no, I don't think no. so. No. no, they just expanded the faculty. Uh, there's no money for another person, but at least for their two years of fellowship, he's got some of the back him up. Yeah, true. This is the meeting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, there's another meeting here in Seattle. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? Uh, clinical. Uh, no. Uh, Investigation. <laughs> Immune society. I'm trying to think of what the C stands for. Clinical. Huh? Clinical. And clinical immune something. What does CIS stand for, everybody? Crime. <laughs> it's a TV program. CIS? A CSI. Yeah. Sorry. CSI. Um, That's coming up this spring, right? It's this month. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, um, it's a much smaller meeting. It's, I think, like, maybe 500 people. Uh, now, driving me crazy. I can't <laughs> where it is. Uh, um, is that like the 23rd, 24th, 25th kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, maybe you <coughs> should probably look it up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. CIS? Yeah. CIS. Um, Where's it located this year? Well, it's here in Seattle, or here. which is unusual. We don't usually get many national meetings here. Right. Because I think most of just where we are getting here, getting the most record, the East Coast, and the And then I heard that the um, quad next year in Orlando is coinciding with the world allergy. Yeah. Is it uh, clinical? Is that next year? Yeah. Clinical Immunology Society. Yeah, that's what I started to say. So <laughs> raising didn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> A little more coffee. <laughs> right. That is. Where is it? Well, uh, parking is almost impossible. Yep. I'm probably legally parked. I'll be out of here by eight. Depending on our fellows, they're the bulk of the presentation. What? Parking's a challenge. We <laughs> <laughs> were just talking yeah. about that. That's why we drive by right. about three times. And yep. certainly you found I found it parked about four or five blocks away. I found a place where it's a, a drop off food till starting at 10 a.m. You know, you have to read the sign closely. Yeah. And I can park so you're here. good till 10? I'm good till 10, yeah. 
Yeah. When is the construction going to stop? <laughs> then the people will start parking now. People will live here or work here. Yeah, but when yeah. the construction stops. I was here at 6.30. So it's taking 20, 20 minutes to find a spot? Well, I had to walk 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. I, drive, I drove around there one loop. <laughs> you ask a good question. When's construction going to stop around here? How many cranes do we have up outside? No, it's a never ending, of yeah. course, is the real answer. Jeez. Well, the, the darn thing is, is that there's just so much money coming into town. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Absolutely. Well, you you saw that on the east side for years. Yeah, no, it's slowed down some at least. We've got like thirty buildings over there, over twenty stories high. Yeah. Sure. It's new at you. Well, you, wait, oh, what? When's the due date? It's the twentieth of uh, this month. Yeah. Oh, you're there. Yeah. Not me personally. <laughs> Jonathan and his wife? Yes. Cool. Yeah. He's going to have a little baby girl or two days to 20. Yes. Wow. That's your first grandchild, right? It's taken a while. It's about time. <laughs> we went to a university function last night and was talking to some other old folks. <laughs> Prototype about somebody who just worked forever. Werner Sampson. He's yeah. still there, Werner Sampson. Yes. He's an amazing guy. He personally is a Holocaust survivor. Then he came to the U.S. He was actually in the U.S. And really before things got awful in Europe, he went back with his father. His father thought he could get a better education still in Germany. And his father was didn't get out. He did. And then has lived the rest of his life here in the U.S. And he's in his late 80s. And Still doing cardiology at the university. Here's one of our fellows. Um, <laughs> oh, I remember there was a medical student, him coming to Grand Rounds, and he seemed like an old man. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you remember Finley Wallace, who was in charge of yeah. Petersdorf's right hand man? Right. He was at this function last night. Is he's in his. He's retired. Your doc is also. My wife always asks me. You're personal doc. Your personal doctor can turn this. Um, David Dale. Yeah. All David was there last night, too. Yeah, we talked time. to him. He's still working. Yep. He must be in his 80s now. He's in his 80s. He said he's still doing lab work and still a clinician. Kelly is our uh, so thought leader. What was this dinner for? Uh, works for the kind of more marketing. Oh, your benefactors of the university. I feel like I'm giving you a tip. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cash that out. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. see what so it gets. wrote it down on our calendar, but we forgot to write where it was. So, gave but, it, so um, I think it's at Ben Royal Hall. Well, maybe it's here in South Lake Union. You're finally in the McCall Hall. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes you can see driving around the city trying to find it. It was good. for people yeah, who are. Is that a turnout? Huh? Is that a turnout? Yeah. Actually, I was invited. I didn't go, though. Yeah. But, you know, just because it's such a, a hassle nice. coming in the yeah, city. Yeah. It was nice. It, you, got, you found parking. Okay? <laughs> oh, they had valet parking. Yeah, they had valet parking. It's for, yeah, you should have been there because it's for people who have given money yeah. for medical yeah. student scholarships. Right. But you yeah, I, yeah, no, I was invited. Yeah, I just didn't. From I have, I've never been to one of those. Yeah. Well, you should. Well, it's easier for you. You're here. I'm one of them. Okay. I think. I don't know about first. But, uh, no. How many people? Show? Oh, uh, 300. Yeah. yeah. It's a big event. So what are you done with? Mostly. Uh, uh, we finish at the end of July. Um, oh, really? The, that, that late? Mm -hmm. um, and then you take your Paul Ramsey. October. Paul Ramsey starts all these things July. off. And then. Actually, not too many people. There's um, yeah. the students talk. To. A couple of students talk and thank people, and then the Benedettis, you know that mm -hmm. name. Sure. He, he's made a big fund at the university. And, uh, he was in college when I was here. Mm -hmm. here. He's he's here. Here. Mm -hmm. So they have a Benedetti family fund, and um, it's got a couple of million, many millions of dollars in it for student fellowships. The number of people speaking was painfully few. Didn't have to sit through a lot of that. <laughs> free drinks, that's the most important thing. Free meal. <laughs> free meal and drinks. <laughs> Why else would you go? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's the 
Do we have your presentation? Good. Yeah? I don't know. Drew should have them hopefully on the computer. He said he had everything all set up. Interesting. Seattle looks to me, I don't think we're as big a city in population, but it looks like a more dynamic city. Um, I stayed downtown a couple of times, and, uh, you know, there really isn't a whole bunch downtown. We, we went to the History Museum one evening. Uh, which function we had out there? Did you go, Jerry? Um, which, I, is, which one? Uh, the, the one out Civil Rights History? Buckhead. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah. I, did, I did go out there. I tried to figure out the whole time why Atlanta exists. You know, most I have it, no, it's not on the coast. Yeah, it's, it's not, not on, on the coast. River. It's not on a major river. Railroad. Railroad. It's got to be the railroad. Yeah. 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 And Sherman. Yeah. He cleaned it all up. He cleaned it up and made it easier to rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we can joke about that here in Seattle. Yeah, not in the down there. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah he's not well liked down there. Most American cities are, you know, obviously on the Good morning. 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 Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a great trip. You know, still the tribes there are so primitive, which is very cool. You know, they don't want to spoil it. You know, the next generation. Don't yeah, they don't have that. Morality. That's a good question. I don't know that they have any health care, so they they don't know. Yeah. You know, there's no plumbing, there's no electricity, there's no running water, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Huge Huh? Christine is supposed to have a presentation. We can all take it. Well, he's he's got, it. Was this hers? Uh, she didn't show. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You're in charge then. Huh? Yeah. 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 Considering the parking, she could get here at 7. Uh, I know. I, I got here a half hour early and half drive. The usual <laughs> spots are like, yeah, they got the boards up. Yeah. 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 I, I folded mine up and didn't seem <laughs> The one close to our cars. Right. I just uh, you. folded it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you drive down, down Nick? Yeah. Did you yeah. drive? I, I saw you walk and you parked away uh, away too. Yeah. This morning? Yeah. No, no, I parked close. Not in sales. But I saw you walk <laughs> and I could swear <laughs> yeah. two or three blocks <laughs> away. She no, oh, yeah, we're about to right. email you. No, we're right across the street from the trophy shop. Ask questions. On okay. So just one. Just walk up the one day. What's over there? Yeah, I, don't look, I don't go that way. Yeah. I'll go look. So you take the sign. Well, what's made it even harder this week is the temporary parking spots yeah. all over the place. I used to go up to Dexter and come down Dexter, sure. and then come around over in this area over here. Mm -hmm. And then all the construction guys figured that out, too. So, so then they used to park on Mercer right down the street there. We got to get access to the parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Or, or no one's going to get it. It is. It's making it tougher. There's no question about it. I realize there's not a whole bunch of people about it. But. Well, the only thing we could do is if we could park under this building, mm -hmm. I think we're just going to have to make that. No, it's good for everybody. I'll do it for next year. You did walk. You didn't go to visit. Yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I took you know, I took a mile off on that trip. I felt yeah. 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 I mean, you said that. I, I paid for the usual. Yeah. Here you go again. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. the drawings. This is art. Well, I got I'm in a close to the mirror. I think the train is going to be a four hour train. And there's one more session. Yeah, we're going to go to Stanley. Yeah, 
yes. job. They pay fourteen dollars an so, hour. You know, is that right? I know it sounds like oh, it's going to be a volunteer. Right. So you get to go to the game. Yeah, you have to. You have to go to forty games. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. We know how that's your bonus is you get to go to games for you. That's and you can get extra tickets. You can get extra tickets, too. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. well, Andrew's in Hawaii. One more line for one. Like you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, now $1,000 a while. Yeah. 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 Did you prepare something? I can remember I launched the first MRI. You said he didn't get it. And they were screaming at it. So times they change. But um, <laughs> okay, no, that'll work. I think he's on one of the committees for topics. So if you want something, I would, no. I'd email him uh, and let him know. Oh, have you gotten any consulting jobs? No, I mean, I've got a medical legal committee on their phone call tomorrow. All right. Yeah, yeah I stopped doing L and I a year ago. Some company, some lawyer, law firm wants to. Yeah, I still have a few left over L and I, but I I stopped doing it about a year ago. Just because I knew a lot of them are taking a year or two to Christina got a flash drive for her See if we can get the get be more serious about trying to see if we can park underneath this building, and because uh, it's getting so frustrating, I can I'm amazed as many of you are here as, as where you found parking. Especially because next week's speaker is uh, Ram Nair from McMaster, who is just a special person, and uh, I wanted many people to come because he gives a brilliant presentation. He's just an engaging. Um, it's kind of a special experience uh, when you get here to come, so I don't want to disadvantage people to come back. Um, so uh, this session is generally a review of the meeting. I'll get it started, and then three of our fellows, uh, but anybody else who went to the meeting wants to chime in of any particular pearls or interesting things they learned. Um, uh, are welcome to do so. So I, I'm going to just sort of give an, an overview. Drew, how do I get this started? Just press the forward. Oh, the, the word of the day for CME is quad AI. Not spelled out quad AI, but just four A's and an I. So, firstly, uh, nothing to disclose relevant to this. Uh, the first thing I wanted to just say is we actually had a lot of people from the Seattle area uh, who presented at the meeting, and I just, I hope I didn't leave anybody out, I just tried to find everybody from any of the Seattle institutions who had a presentation, and I just listed <laughs> here on the first couple of slides. Uh, Matthew um, had all the things that you can see there um, regarding his work, maybe I'll get him to present. 
done it at some point here, a lot of genomic work, which I barely understand, which is going very well. Um, Jay had a, a poster, uh, as you can see on the bottom here, a combination of omalizumab and misspelled intravenous gamma globulin, uh, the treatment of common variable and a severe persistent asthma patient. Uh, then we had colleagues over at Benaroya and Virginia Mason, led primarily by Bill Kwok over there, but also colleagues Dave Robinson uh, and Mary Farrington, who had a number of posters. Um, the bottom one is an oral presentation that uh, Andrew uh, Parker did, uh, one of our second year fellows who's now over luxuriating success in Kauai. Um, so I think, let's go back, did I get everybody in that presentation? Uh, these are some other presentations. Troy um, gave a number of presentations somewhat similar to uh, what he would give us here in Journal Club. Uh, Steve Ziegler over from uh, Ben Arroyo. I didn't <coughs> down on the bottom, early origin of tolerance. And then uh, Steve Tillis had two presentations. And then uh, the name on the bottom here, some of you may not recognize, Lahari from Poor. She's the newest faculty here. And she didn't go to the meeting, so I'm assuming this is work that was a carryover from her fellowship when she was back at Einstein in the Bronx. So anyway, the point I'm making is Seattle represented itself pretty well presentations at this meeting. Then uh, just a brief discussion of what the plenary session content was. So it's now, you know, they've shortened this meeting, so it's, there are sessions on Thursday that I didn't get to, and if anybody was there and wants to comment on Thursday's session. But the first of the plenary sessions now is on Friday, and the meeting is basically Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday uh, is the core of the meeting. So the first of these plenary sessions was titled Stories from the Quad AI Foundation. So those of you who are old enough to remember what's now the Quad AI Foundation started as a trust called the ERT, the Education Research Trust, basically an attempt to collect money for funding, training in our field. And then the name changed a couple years later to the ART, and now it's just called the Foundation. So the president this year, uh, and they've been giving grants of various sizes to young scientists, young faculty, and fellows uh, as long as this has existed. So the president wanted to pick out three very successful examples of money that was given to young faculty who have gone on to do very successful work and have good careers. So he picked out uh, three individuals. The first was Al Hoffman. He's done really kind of pioneering work on auto-inflammatory diseases, and I just made some notes here. He starts the story you know, by talking about atypical cold urticaria and basically unraveling the disease of familial cold, auto-inflammatory syndrome, muckle well syndrome, and what's called NOMID, all basically diseases of abnormal interleukin-1 beta pathology. Mm -hmm. So one of the most successful grants probably uh, given by the foundation. Then the second individual was uh, Jordan Orange, also a very successful outcome, uh, leader in immunodeficiency disease, gave a history of his work with NK cell disorders. The third one was totally new to me. I didn't know what this disease was. <coughs> Lowy's Eats Syndrome, again, a recipient of a grant. So I looked it up. I mean, she talked about this disease in the context of its immunologic uh, uh, abnormalities. So it's a disease of mutations of T TGF beta genes and leads to atopic dermatitis and a rare variant of eosinophilic esophagitis. If you look in the literature about this disease, they talk about it as a collagen disease. It's more like um, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Marfan syndrome is primarily a disease of collagen abnormality. People get aortic aneurysms and aortic 
my section, so that's its main political presentation. But she, uh, the presenter here, worked with it in the context of its rare uh, immune abnormalities. Saturday's session was on severe asthma, mechanisms, consequences, and therapy, and I wrote to myself here, nothing new. <laughs> so, I don't have anything else to say about that. I honestly didn't take any notes. I'm, I usually write down a lot of stuff the old-fashioned way. I don't take notes. Obviously, I learned to take notes on paper. I still do it that way. The keynote address was, to me, the most interesting thing in the entire presentation. How many here in the room went to that presentation? So Tony Fauci gave that presentation. I would assume everybody knows Tony Fauci's name. He's been the head of the uh, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease for about 40 years uh, at the NIH. And he gave a fascinating presentation, doing it by all the presidents uh, during which he was in this position. And the emerging or re-emerging infections occurred during each president's um, uh, term, starting back with the AIDS epidemic and Reagan. So he's been in this position for the Reagans, the Bushes, the Clintons, Obama. And he told just fascinating stories and I didn't think he did it in an immodest way at all. He showed himself in the Oval Office with the President. He showed himself on Air Force One with the President. Uh, he related conversations that they would have to him. I think when Bill Clinton turned to him after he just discussed with him AIDS. And uh, you know, he talked through AIDS. He talked through Zika. He talked through Ebola and how the NIH needed to be prepared for unexpected epidemics. And basically, Clinton turned to him at one point and said, well, Tony, what do we do about this? And he said, well, we need an institute of vaccinology. And he gave the example that, you know, he had the president's ear, and in virtually no time, they built the new institute of vaccinology at the NIH, which has been invaluable in being ready to prepare new vaccines with an amazing speed that we never had to to do before for diseases like Ebola and Zika. So it was just, uh, I, I knew Fauci when I was at the NIH, just as sort of a young buck getting started, and he closed with a picture of Trump with three question marks. You can figure out what he meant by that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, my feeling at the end of his presentation was it's, with the turmoil that's going on in Washington, it's great to have him in the position that he's in because he's a bold guy who's going to tell Trump directly what he thinks about preparing for whatever is going to come next. And through every one of these presidents' terms, something unexpected happened that could have been a worldwide pandemic. So that was that was fascinating to me. Uh, Sunday presentation was on drug allergy. And again, there wasn't terribly much new there. They just made the point that we're well aware of that 95% of people with penicillin allergy histories don't have penicillin allergy and the value to American medicine, hospital costs of defining that, uh, testing people and having them use cheaper and effective antibiotics and not moving to expensive more difficult, more dangerous uh, antibiotics. And Monday's session was using the immune system to fight the immune system. The first two speakers here were really from oncology, and these are examples of uh, treatments being developed by oncologists, things that I didn't know very much about. Um, fascinating. So the first one here, chimeric antigen receptors is mostly a treatment for ALL, people who are unresponsive essentially to all other conventional treatments. And what they do here is they engineer T cells to kill tumor bearing CD19 positive cells, which are essentially markers for B cells. And the, the story of this is, you know, basically what you induce in these people is cytokine storm. And it's amazing that people survive. Uh, these are essentially people who have no other option. They've failed all other forms of treatment, and they're using T cells to try and destroy their malignant cells, but in so doing, these people get incredibly sick and uh, just a, a 
hair-raising story to have him uh, uh, discuss that. And the, the next one down, immune checkpoint inhibitors, is again an oncology theory, uh, system of using monoclonal antibodies, mostly to treat lymphoma. And the main story here is that effective T cells sort of get fatigued, and they use certain monoclonal antibodies to reinvigorate them, if you will, and it's been a very successful treatment for Hodgkin's especially. And then there were two abstracts. You know, when you walk through the abstract aisles, there are like 300 papers, and it's overwhelming, and uh, I don't know how the rest of you approach that. I just go to a couple of them that attract my interest. So I went to this one, number 722. This was uh, a paper about... Uh, uh, oral plasma calocrine inhibitor that ultimately could be treatment for HAE. And the actual poster itself was on preclinical studies of studying this molecule with cultured endothelial cells or its action in plasma. And as I was looking at it, I said to him, do you have any clinical data? So the guy who was presenting the paper said, we just got our clinical data yesterday. And so he opens his data book and he shows me incredibly positive data like 90% control of HAE attacks with a once-a-day pill. So this with virtually no side effects. So in other words, calocrine, as we know, leads to the activation of bradykinin, the main molecule obviously causing the angioedema. And if this continues to be as promising, uh, it would be uh, much easier treatment than the things we currently have. And probably people in the room here know more about this, but look very impressive to me. I don't know, it's a private company. I don't know that it's being bankrolled by any of the pharma companies that are currently in the HAE field. The, the other one that interested me is I've always wondered what we're doing when we test people who have metal allergies, especially when you get referrals from orthopedic surgeons, and uh, they want us to patch tests for metals to decide it why a joint has failed or to test them ahead of time. Are they going to have problems with these patients based on their history? And I usually tell patients, well, the patch testing materials we have are meant for contact dermatitis. It strikes me as an extrapolation to really know that they're going to tell you anything about metal inside your body. So this is a paper out of McMaster. And the main thing I wanted to point out is I asked them, well, what are you using for patch testing these people, and she said, well, we use this stuff from smart practice. I had never heard of smart practice. The rest of you know about their materials? So I have it in a handout there for you. They sell all of this stuff commercially. They're a company in California, and I don't know how well you can see it here, but they have pre-made testing materials for dental materials, orthopedic materials, long list of stuff, much more, and I don't know any reason that um, that we can't buy it and use it here. We don't do it at NAC. I, I didn't know these products existed. We actually have 15 of them. We have 15 of them? In the lab, yeah. We just recently started acquiring them? About six months ago. Yeah. Um, so in a nutshell, what they did in this paper is they, looked, they did a retrospective case review. They found 23 patients. They did testing with panels of these, and then the bottom outcome, as you might imagine, was that they found if you pre-tested based on history, it changed what orthopedic surgeons did, something like 9 out of 11 times. If they did it retrospectively, and people were having joint failure, it changed what orthopedic surgeons did when they went in and they took out the joint and they redid it. Not only do they have the metals themselves, they have the, the, the components of the glues, um, and they even have topical antibiotic treatment, uh, uh, testing. So much more extensive than I knew. When did we discover that these were available, Frank? Yeah, uh, again, about a year ago. It just obviously keeps coming up, yeah. as you mentioned. So we did a little research. Uh, and the nice part is, you know, for example, even if it's just, you know, the things that are on the true test, it's usually not adequate, plus you waste a whole patch of stuff you don't really need to use. So this, you can just dose it out as you need it. So we you don't have to buy the whole paddling. We can buy individual. They're all individual. They're all individual. They come in syringes. Now. So hopefully a resource uh, that's useful. Before these guys came out, they had to get this stuff from Canada sort of right. quasi-legally. Yeah. 
right. and the FDA has been really nasty about that now. So this is great to know that we can get it in the states now. Well, it's interesting that the people who did this paper in Canada, but they came to the U.S. to buy the materials. <laughs> what's it, what's I mean, the cost of uh, each one of these? I mean, do they vary in how long uh, they viable? To be honest, I don't know exactly. Yeah, but I was curious. The tubes are a couple hundred dollars a piece, but okay. you can test 50 or 60 people. Right. right. Yeah, okay. compared to the true test. Right. It's What's the shelf length? Right. I think they're about a year. Yeah, a year and a half, two years. It's pretty good. The question is, what does that mean? It's, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, in I general, I thought it was a pretty good meeting. Yeah. Get your joints next month. So, who wants to go next? I've got uh, our three fellows. Christina. Unlikely to develop tolerance to their FPIs or outgrow it, 
um, if they also had concurrent positive milk-specific IgE. So again, something to counsel families about. But this is a non-IgE disease. That is true, yes. But they do find that, um, that there are patients that will go on a little bit later in life, those children, to develop IgE that's specific to the food. And some of them will have also IgE-mediated um, hypersensitivity to the food as well as FIs to the food. Um, in terms of definitions, these came out of the guidelines. Early onset FPI is less than nine months, late onset greater than nine months. Mild FPI reactions are just mild vomiting, diarrhea, or lethargy. Um, severe is hypotension, shock, and metabolic acidosis. Um, acute FPI, um, the symptoms will resolve within 24 hours after elimination of the food, and these children have normal, normal growth. Um, if there isn't a uh, elimination to or it's not identified, and then daily ingestion of the food will lead to chronic FPIs, where they can have chronic kind of um, smoldering diarrhea, vomiting, poor weight gain, and then present with failure to thrive. And then the classic FPIs are food-specific IgE negative, and then the atypical FPIs they've defined as food-specific I sorry, that should be IgE positive, I apologize, um, kind of like we just talked about. And then these are um, a little table from the guidelines. Um, in terms of they're proposing basically that to diagnose it, it um, requires uh, the patient to fulfill the major criteria and then at least three of the minor criteria. So the major criteria on the left is um, vomiting in the, that one to four hour period and then absence of any sort of IgE mediated allergic um, skin or respiratory symptoms. So um, basically making sure that it's not a type one hypersensitivity. And then um, for the minor criteria you can see here um, a lot of it is clinical, but um, a second episode, so not just a single episode, because you want to make sure it's not a gastroenteritis, especially if they're having symptoms for 24 hours, like a viral gastroenteritis. So um, basically that they, upon a second exposure, will have a similar reaction, um, that again, um, the repeated um, vomiting after eating a different food, so more applies to more than one food, um, the extreme lethargy, hypotension, hypothermia, diarrhea, um, and then the need for IV fluids. They do talk, I didn't go into detail about this, I'm not sure if Jake will, they did talk a little bit about if they don't meet all these criteria, then how can you make the diagnosis? And they really <coughs> caution as to whether you should do an oral food challenge to make that diagnosis, but that's something that you could consider in the clinic. Just know that the 15% of the patients will go on to develop hypotension and shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, acute management I thought was interesting, um, particularly, obviously, they're going to need, um, in particular for children, aggressive um, fluid resuscitation and the, um, typically normal saline 20 mil per kill um, bolus. But then um, on Dancitron or Zofran, um, they recommend, especially um, if, if you look in the table, in the um, moderate to severe presenting symptoms below, um, which I thought was interesting. And then methylprednisolone in the more severe cases when they per case. Um, and then obviously correcting any of those metabolic derangements. Um, they also go on to give a table, which I didn't include here down below, with just how the, um, you can counsel the parents to, if there's an accidental ingestion or they're unsure of an ingestion, to manage things at home and what signs and symptoms to look for to in terms of oral rehydration therapy. Um, in terms of dietary management, um, for infants with cow's milk or soy peptides, which are the most common, they do recommend uh, the mom should not undergo an elimination diet if the baby is asymptomatic from breast milk. Um, breastfeeding should be continued um, if possible. Um, and then that you can use a casein or whey-based extensively hydrolyzed formula in most cases for these patients. But about 20% of them will actually require an amino acid-based formula. Um, and then you also are supposed to, um, in terms of the guidelines, recommend that they avoid all baked forms of these as well. In terms of food introduction, I mean, this really, this area causes a lot of anxiety for parents, um, obviously so at home, and so, especially if they're having FPIs to multiple foods. So, um, just some general guidelines, a new food every four days, start with small amounts and increase because it is dose dependent. Um, typically start with fruits and veggies, um, and then some of these low FPI grains, um, and then Listen to the parents' worries about introduction at home. You might need to bring them to clinic to do some of these food introductions for close observation. And then when you're doing close observation for either the family at home or in the clinic, 
just remember that it's going to be like an all-day observation. So oftentimes, if you're telling them to introduce a new food at home, they should be doing it around breakfast or lunchtime, not at dinner time. And then everybody goes to sleep, and the baby's having symptoms throughout the night that might not be recognized at first. Um, and then in terms of grain elimination, um, um, they gave a really nice um, dietary talk on the nutritional deficiencies. We don't often think about grain elimination, particularly in infants, but to think about iron, zinc, iodine, um, to think about developmental delays, which can happen, especially with delay of solids and grains. So um, feeding delays and dysphagia, growth, speech delays, and then also thinking about how it affects the um, microbiome, which they have some data on as well. Um, and then I just included it to, um, at the end to summarize, I think a nice um, food guide, which is in the new guidelines as well, as to how you can um, counsel parents, especially those um, for children that have multiple FPIs, what kind of foods they can introduce and when they can introduce it. And then it kind of categorizes it in the columns to lower risk, moderate risk, or higher risk foods. Um, which I think is a nice kind of outline, especially for a lot of us that aren't as familiar with introduction of foods. And that was it. Is, is it a cell-mediated reaction, immune reaction? Yeah, the current idea is they didn't talk about mechanism during these. It was more just about our guidelines and how we practice that. Yeah, I think the current guidelines, or the current thought is that, it, yeah, it's more cellular-mediated. Are you going to talk about that since you picked the same topic? Do you have anything on mechanism? Yeah, I mean, my this, that was a great presentation. Probably superior to mine and covered most of what I was going to say, actually. <laughs> Um, I think Dr. Naimi, when he presented on FIES last year, showed some data that they have biopsied uh, the gut and showed some Th2 uh, kind of inflammatory response, and the thought is that that causes fluid shift into the gut. But I also think that it's kind of preliminary, and no one really has a for sure mechanism on it yet. Yeah, I don't think they've advanced beyond that. So it's, it, and it's... In practice, I mean, this is such a vague, it's really difficult. And this is nice that we're, you know, starting to kind of put a table down to say these are the safer foods. Because, you know, let's yeah. say a few months ago was more at six months of age, you want to introduce yellow fruits and vegetables. I didn't necessarily know exactly what that meant, right? I mean, and so I think it's a big conundrum. I think another conundrum in this area is when do you actually challenge these kids? And how do you challenge them? Um, I, I had I've done one F by his challenge uh, when I first started here, and only because it was a ch it was a child who had had egg in small amounts we thought in baked goods, so we did a baked egg challenge just to reintroduce that, and the child then vomited you know three hours after ingestion, and it was it, you know it was, this was in Everett in the outpatient office, and I, after the third or fourth episode of emesis, I called for backup, um, so ever since then I haven't done an F by his challenge in my office. Um, and, you know, you know that, that, that was kind of, kind of PTSD from that. But I think it would be nice to develop a challenge clinic, and we talked about this earlier, at, you know, at Children's, mm -hmm. so we can do this in a, in a more controlled fashion. Mm -hmm. well, that makes me wonder, you know, I, I, as an internist and from someone who trained before this disease existed, um, how often does this, you know, how often do we see this in the community? I mean, I've seen like four in the last week, but that's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> so, I'm, yeah, so it's, it, it depends. I mean, what about you, Frank? Yeah, I, I'd say maybe 10 a year. Yeah. But, you know, and I've done five or six actually in the office, and uh, I don't know, maybe just lucky, but they yeah. all passed in the second year of life. I usually don't push my, it sort of depends on the initial history a bit, right. although that might be tempered by how much they ingested, obviously. But 18 months of age, often, I mean, which is supported somewhat from the data that a, a good percentage of kids outgrow it. Did they talk about, for example, if it's milk, actually doing the first challenge with milk and baked goods, kind of analogous to the IgE thing? No, I didn't talk I mean, about that. Obviously, it's a hard thing to study, because if yeah. they pass, you don't know if they would have passed. Right. <laughs> and you, it, looks, it also depends on where the data is from. So like South Korea, yeah. for example, will say that their their children will pass, or will grow out of milk or soy f pies very early, mm -hmm. versus you know if you look at data from Mount Sinai, um, it's much later. Yeah. Do they get um, followed up with with skin tests for milk and the development of IgE? 
Not, um, not necessarily. So they didn't really give guidelines yeah. as to who they recommend doing skin prick testing or um, serum IgE testing for. They just kind of gave the data of what's been found. I think a couple of the, the <laughs> position, they had kind of conflicting position statements, but if you read between the lines, it was saying don't use IgE testing, obviously, for diagnosis of FPIs, but to consider IgE testing maybe maybe at the start, but definitely at all follow-up visits, because as you pull it, pull it out of the diet and they don't have it in there, that right. then you go on to develop IgE. Right. Yeah. And then you want to know that, obviously, because when you're going to do your follow-up challenge to FPIs to try and prove that they're over it, that they now may have a... The confused, I would estimate about a third or so, you know, they have eczema and they happen to be atopic as well. Right. And it's not <coughs> uncommon to see they're allergic, so to speak, to egg and peanut, but they have f to milk and soy. Right. And then so you sort of talk about mm -hmm. the implications, obviously the initial treatment's the same, but you talk about the clinical course implication with the parents and that sort of thing. And you talk about this last year too, but that's part of the reason they also feel like Korea might get through their f faster is that our data from the U.S. coming from Sinai was a, you know, tertiary referral center that had right. severe atopic disease on top of their FPIs, right. and right. that they were more yeah. likely to be IgE positive, yeah. and they had resolution at like three years of age of their cow's milk versus Korea was right. only like two. Right now, yeah. yeah. Jake, you had uh, what you think is the oldest adult patient with this disease? Uh, What's yeah, that story? actually, it was also Dr. Naimi's patient who over to uh, UW so they could get a challenge in kind of a safe environment at the hospital, uh, which was also a severe reaction. Yeah, tell, uh, tell us about that. <laughs> so it, it was, I think the gentleman was about 56 years old, um, maybe even a little bit older than that. It's been a while since. He was since in his late day. 50s, early 60s, yeah. Uh, and he had, he had normally, yeah. he ended up having a five yeah. to cashew. Previously tolerated and had no problem whatsoever. And they actually made a specific statement at the meeting to say that there's no adults with nut F pies. Uh, so he kind of would kind of fit two fields of being oldest and first with nuts. Um, but he had uh, cashew in kind of a candied form at, from Costco. He had a pretty violent vomiting reaction, which was followed by diarrhea. But didn't really know what, what had caused it. Uh, and then had uh, a couple smaller episodes that weren't quite as severe over the course of about a year's period until he got to Dr. Naimi. Um, and then once he did get there, he had had, again, one more kind of severe episode that got him to a hospital where he had to get IV fluids. Uh, and then he saw Dr. Naimi and had all appropriate kind of skin testing and IgE testing for nuts and seeds. By that point, he had kind of narrowed it down to seeming to be always cashew related. Uh, but got a good IgE workup, uh, which was all negative, and looked consistent with FPIs, and so got him over to the UW, and uh, Matt challenged him, and he had just a, a very severe reaction from reading the, the notes. Uh, I think about a matter of <clears throat> 30 minutes to an hour, started having emesis. Uh, Matt gave him kind of full treatment with even with epinephrine, even though they kind of don't say you need to do this in the guidelines, it was a very violent reaction. It was trending towards hypotension, so he's got started on IV fluids, epinephrine. Matt gave him Zofran, which they note in here, uh, there's two small case series that if you give it very early into the acute episode of FPIs, that you can actually blunt the, the vomiting response. Uh, so it's a good thing to think of when you're doing oral food challenges. So he gave them that. Uh, got him steroids and essentially got him over to the emergency department where they gave him more fluids um, and continued to treat him. He was kept overnight in the hospital and actually developed bloody diarrhea kind of in the middle of the night and that's what they kind of say here in the guidelines is that you expect if you're going to have diarrhea it's usually five to ten hours after you start the oral food challenge or your acute episode. So he stayed overnight in the hospital, got rehydrated, uh, and was feeling pretty close to baseline and got out the next day. He was, it sounds like he was really happy about that. I mean, he, he really wanted to have someone observe that. I, yeah. I felt that it was relatively unusual. And I think he's had bloody stools in the past. Mm -hmm. And so the, to kind of prove that to himself and other people was kind of satisfying, it sounds like. 
Yeah, I mean, he was, he was such a unique case from what it sounds like that he was really frustrated with how severe reactions he has, but nothing to explain them and really wanted to have some kind of proof that this right. is what's going on. Part of a fascinating, so I guess, a, a statement that I was an internist and I've never seen this, uh, I'd better be cautious. Uh, <laughs> this one did one. <laughs> yeah. I think, too, like, for the general pediatrician, you know, it's just how much is, yeah. that ties is really on their differential and how many kids have, you know, like the chronic form or it's daily vomiting because they're getting kind of low exposure or they're not fully becoming hypotensive and presenting to an emergency room and how many kids, you know, have we seen with just daily vomiting of unclear etiology and um, we attribute it to other causes and they have failure to thrive and could it be F pies and it's just not diagnosed, I think is interesting and something we should be educating the general pediatricians more about as well. And emergency rooms on some mm -hmm. level, right? I mean, yeah. to the vast majority, as you guys know, is they're, they're diagnosed with viral gastroenteritis and sent yeah. home. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually the parents who will look it up, find out, probably what it is, and present it to the pediatrician who says, oh, this is what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. who may, they may have not seen a case of that fight before. Um, so it's something that I think as we as allergists can educate the pediatricians, and also, you know, your docs, just so they have it on the differential. At least. And I think every child, if anyone sees any one of these kids, I think it's important that they go home with a, a letter. It's kind of, kind of an FPIES letter or an ER letter. You can find this online. Um, where you essentially state what we discussed, what FPIES is, they've had a reaction to this in the past, consider this in the differential diagnosis, mm -hmm. if this child ends up to this emergency room with vomiting. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they'll, they'll take everything else in the picture, but if the child has a fever or other symptoms, but, um, it's just good for each parent to have that in their wallet or purse. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that was, do you think there's anything else on FPIES to say? No, so let's move on to our last topic then. While you're getting up there, Mike Weiss pointed out to me in a text that I left out one of our presenters at the meeting, Jennifer Reagan, the newest partner at NAC, um, also had a poster that she presented at the meeting. So I, I apologize for that. I tried to go through the whole program and find every Seattle related. It may have been that she was listed in Chicago, uh, and I didn't know to look for that. All right. So um, I took um, from two different talks information about vaccines um, from the, this year's meeting. And one of the talks was a difficult cases talk about um, the use of vaccines in immunocompromised patients and then also vaccine allergic reactions. And then uh, one of the advanced clinical immunology sessions about the current pneumococcal vaccine guidelines. So. A lot of it is review, but it's some stuff that I thought was particularly relevant to cases that we see both in adult and pediatrics, allergy and immunology. Um, so the vaccine and um, immunocompromised patients, so the current guidelines is from 2014, so it's a kind of an expert consensus of kind of the data that we had, um, and it's in uh, Jackie. So it goes through different categories of patients with antibody deficiencies, different T-cell immunodeficiencies, complement deficiencies, and then phagocytic or neutrophil deficiencies and breaks it up into different categories and then with the recommendations about the different types of vaccines they can and can't receive um, based on the data and the kind of expert opinion and um, guidelines. So then the first are the um, B lymphocyte or humoral primary immune, de immune deficiencies and they break that into the more severe antibody deficiencies, so SLA and CDID. Um, and then the strictly contraindicated ones there, um, notably the oral polio um, one is not just in the patient and then also contacts, um, that because you can get shedding from the oral polio vaccine, which we don't really use anymore. I know I've seen patients in um, immunology clinic who um, actually got polio virus before um, from oral, oral polio vaccine prior to the diagnosis of their XLA. Um, and then other live viral and bacterial vaccines are all um, contraindicated. Um, they kind of put a caveat out for MMR and varicella and um, rotavirus, although um, you know some of these patients do end up getting these vaccines prior to their diagnosis. 
Um, you know, there are cases that I've seen of rotavirus that's been transmitted, not just from the patient getting the vaccine or, you know, um, if, if you're around someone else who had, like infants who had a rotavirus vaccine, they could have shedding. Um, and then kind of once they're on immunoglobulin, they'll get the passive immunity um, to many of these um, um, viruses. And then the less severe antibody deficiencies, again, oral polio and BCG and yellow fever are strictly contraindicated. Um, and then the other vaccines you can have an attenuated immune response to. Um, they do recommend um, HIV and pneumococcal vaccination. And some of these patients may not be on immunoglobulin replacement. Um, the T lymphocyte or cellular primary immunodeficiency. So for the severe combined immune deficiencies and the George, um, complete George or without a thymus, um, avoid all live viral vaccines, and I forgot to put here, and bacterial vaccines as well. The main bacterial ones is the BCG and the um, typhoid um, ones are the ones that are um, probably coming to most clinical practice. Um, the severe combined immune deficiency after stem cell transplant really depends on kind of your, um, your immunologist and um, transplant team at the point um, uh, uh, doing um, after immune reconstitution and evaluation, um, probably years after the transplant, making a decision um, to revaccinate. And then partial defects like the George Wiscott AT. Um, I think you know a lot of these patients we would avoid live viral vaccines and combined immune deficiencies. But if they are milder, um, they actually give ranges about the CD4 counts as to and the age guidelines of where you can consider vaccinating them to um, varicella and MMR vaccines. And you might choose varicella first to. Um, so that if the patient does get um, varicella, you can give acyclovir. But they were saying anywhere, like CD4 counts of around 1,000 and then doing um, a function with uh, um, mitogen stimulation to PHA or an antigen stimulation as well. But um, CD4 counts of about 1,000 um, to 1,500 and kind of between one to two years of age at that point. Um, so there's definitely guidelines out there. Um, and then other primary immune deficiencies, um, so there's no contraindications for vaccines for complement deficiencies, and you would want to actually give them um, uh, pneumococcal HIV um, and those vaccines. Uh, and then for the phagocytic defects such as um, CGD, you'd want to avoid all live viral vaccines, all, all live bacterial vaccines, especially BCG. Um, and then other considerations they talked about was um, with steroids, um, you know, the, you can still give um, live uh, vaccines with um, low-dose steroids that are not prolonged. So they were talking about a dose of about 2 milligrams per kilogram um, for about two weeks or less. Um, and then to hold off for either two to four weeks um, if the dose is higher or you have more prolonged um, courses of steroids. Biologics, they also broke up, um, up into kind of a mild versus severe type of, um, in terms of more the strength of the biologics, so the milder ones they were saying were azathioprine and um, 6MP, and those, didn't, um, uh, those biologics um, didn't necessarily um, preclude the um, patient from getting a live vaccine. And then um, other considerations are household contacts and um, um, uh, pregnant, uh, uh, pregnant women and then um, contacts in, um, of close contacts of pregnant women. And um, more in relation to avoiding the live viral vaccines and then, uh, or bacterial vaccines and also vaccines that you could have shedding from. So then the second... Um, <coughs> Uh, topic that um, was in the difficult cases were vaccine allergic reactions. So um, the rate of anaphylaxis to vaccines is about one to one million um, estimated. Um, it might be more frequent than that. And um, uh, they broke down into uh, how to approach vaccine allergic reactions. And if, you know, if you just have one vaccine given, 
it might be more simple to just uh, look at the components and go from there. But if um, I just had a case with Dan last week where um, a patient from uh, El Salvador came and didn't have any records of vaccines, and I'll present that case right now, and um, they how to approach that. So it was a 16-year-old male who moved from um, El Salvador with no reportedly received childhood vaccines, but um, didn't have any records. So he um, last September, uh, last September and October, one month apart, he got the following sets of vaccines, and each time had a really good story for um, uh, anaphylaxis, um, and was treated with epinephrine both times. Um, the first time he got the um, these uh, 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 eight vac seven vaccines, and then the second time he got these five. And um, both times he had received epinephrine in the clinic, and these were two different clinics. One was in Arizona, one was in Seattle. I think the one in Seattle gave him um, steroids afterwards, and he wasn't in the emergency room or um, seen in the hospital uh, after these reactions. So, <laughs> And I'm not sure what the... Um, if the, the second, um, from the second set of vaccines, um, the clinic who gave it to him actually took a history or got that information that he had reacted after the first set. So, um, you know, I think our approach, um, you know, was to go with the second set of vaccines, and we started to pull out um, just the vaccines themselves and do skin, te skin prick testing, and that's what the, um, they recommended, except um, then what I... Um, you know, I saw that MMR and varicella were two of them, so we actually just put a gelatin on, <laughs> and that became, that reacted as positive. So um, he had a um, large reaction to gelatin. So in terms of gelatin allergy, the first uh, reported case was um, in 1993, um, and it was for anaphylaxis to MMR, and it's a it's a stabilizer in vaccines used for transport and storage. Um, it was. It's been more reported in the Japanese, in Japan, in the Japanese population. Um, they would said that um, certain DTaP formulations at the time also had gelatin. So maybe one of the thoughts was, did that sensitize these patients um, who are getting DTaP prior to their live viral vaccine at one year of age? Um, and what I didn't know is all these vaccines here. Um, actually contain gelatin, and some of them that we um, use pretty readily. Um, so, and actually, so this is not, this is, I saw a case with Dr. Naini last year um, that we had a patient who um, had um, got MMR and varicella and had anaphylaxis, and um, we did skin prick testing to gelatin that was also positive. So, um, you know, one in a million, but I've seen two already. So. Is there a difference between hog and bovine gelatin in terms of immunogenicity? That, I'm not sure. Do, do these mostly have I, bovine? Or I, do you know? We did I, testing to bovine. And I, some of them specified bovine, and I don't remember the joints. But by far, the MMR and the varicella have like orders of like 15 milligrams. Mm -hmm. so a lot. Mm -hmm. Thinking of it like a food allergy. Whereas influenza has micrograms. Yeah, and then they have um, the I forget where, but there's a there's a table that shows the dosing of the amount of gelatin in these yeah. vaccines. So that Actually might be texted used. it to Dan yesterday. <laughs> yeah, this came up. They were positive gelatin. You said yeah. were they positive to any of these others on the prick skin testing? Uh, Did you actually test? No, I didn't. Oh, oh, so I thought I, you had. We right. just applied. I was like, oh, you know, that I saw MMR and Versa. I was like, let's do throw on the gelatin, and we were getting the rest of the stuff ready. Oh, and you didn't. And gelatin the became positive. So but that's what I've done on a couple of patients like this because it's like, can they get a flu shot? And yeah. then they were negative. They were negative. They were fine. With it. Mm -hmm. And they have flu. Um, so they have an influenza vaccine combination. Um, uh, influenza vaccines without gelatin. So you just have to um, check which one you're using um, if there's a concern or a history. Um, but some of these vaccines, you may not have an option. And one of the things Dan brought up um, was, should you know, we always give MMR and varicella together at one year of age, you know. If, depending, you know, I still think it's a rare occurrence, but definitely being ready to treat um, a 
possible reaction in the office is some a consideration and you know should these vaccines be separated so it is a take home message if it's one in a million um, well, we think that almost all reactions are either gelatin or used to be the egg protein and no, the, no one's actually allergic to the vaccine protein itself yeah the I've, the more common ones Gelatin is definitely one of the more common ones. Um, latex. The and then the, the last um, the last part um, I was going to go over was the pneumococcal vaccine recommendations uh, for patients who are night, um, uh, for adult um, patients, and they differ slightly in the pediatric population, but. Um, in adults, um, specifically in the category of immunocompromised patients, so um, between um, 19 and 64 years of age in patients with um, uh, certain types of immunodeficiencies or risks, risk factors, um, the recommendation is to give one PCD13 and two pneumococcal polysaccharide, um, the 23 valent, um, and then above 65, that changes. So. Everyone should have still gotten a PCV13 if they hadn't gotten one, and they should have had, uh, if, and if they have, are up to date, all they need is one additional um, um, pneumococcal polysaccharide. And then the immunocompromising conditions they talked about um, are listed here, so not just primary immune deficiencies, but other, um, other um, immunocompromising conditions. And all this information is available on the CDC website. So um, I thought the algorithm, you know, it gets kind of complicated. So, you know, it's something that we always have to look up. So in specifically patients who, you know, um, are immunocompromised or have one of those conditions, if they received a pneumoco uh, pneumococcal, uh, oh, PCV13 um, between 19 and 64 and you're seeing them, so then what do you do next if you want to protect them? And this isn't so much for a vaccine challenge, but you want to, if they're not on immunoglobulin replacement and you want to um, give them more protection for the guidelines. So um, if they had already received one dose of um, a polysaccharide vaccine, then you'd give a second one five years after. If they've gotten one PCB13 and two um, polysaccharide vaccines, then you don't have to give anything else until after 65. Um, and then if they hadn't received a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, you want to make sure that that's given eight weeks after the um, PCV13. Um, and then the second dose, five years after the first dose of um, the polysaccharide vaccine. And then if they didn't receive the PCV13, you would give the PCV13 and then kind of work through the polysaccharides. So it, it just, it, you know, you have, I, I still probably would have to go to the CDC website and look up specific scenarios, but just to let you know that they're out there um, and, you know, they're pretty well defined and most patients will fit kind of one of these. Um, because I think in the clinic you, you get a lot of patient referrals and they've got, maybe gotten some, not all, and how to best catch them up. Almost half the time they don't know what they've had. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That, that's very true. That's all, also on the CDC site, there's a great table about excipients in U.S. vaccine, in case that ever comes up, like polysorbate, or et cetera, et cetera. What do they recommend when they've had the vaccines and you titer their antibodies and they're all negatives? Does that fall into any of these equations? Well, then I think you would talk about a possible antibody deficiency. Maybe, maybe replacement, but it's. I think these are for patients who are not going to get replaced. All right. Thank you all. So we have a great speaker next week. Tony so just told me he has fascinating new data on eosinophil. He's a guy who does do sputum and
I'm going to be a grandfather and, and uh, congratulations. So, Boston. Boston. Okay. I mean, there are a lot of great speakers in Boston. They don't need me there. No, but uh, so, so we have a uh, we have patient programs as well, and some of the doctors don't like. Their They're all local people.